my trigger was stress. I was a stress eater. <laughs> so, you know, just really figuring that out. So it, it's a number of things. It's food, it's exercise, it's mindset. It's all of that. This is the Anthropology Podcast, the podcast where we optimize the bodies, brains, and lifestyles of entrepreneurs, go-getters, and world-changing innovators. Welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Walker. As an anthropologist and naturopathic doctor, I optimize the health and performance of badass women working to change the world as entrepreneurs and go-getters. You know, people exactly like you. Your business, body, balance, and inner badass, these are the themes we are exploring. Before we jump into the interview, I want to invite you to join our free Facebook community, Legacy. If you want to be something amazing, you need to surround yourself with amazing people. The legacy community is made up of badass women living, not leaving, but living our legacy every single day. We are leaders, parents, entrepreneurs, and innovators collectively committed to leaving the world better than we found it. My mission is to support the health and optimization of these badass superheroes, literally to places we never thought imaginable. If you are on a mission and get it that your health is the key to your unlimited potential, then join us. We are super awesome. You can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash BE legacy. See you there. Today's guest is sharing an important story and journey with us. Tabitha Carr is a healer from Oklahoma City, and she has a transformational story and is now putting her story and her life to work to transform the lives of others. At 16 years of age, she was put on her first blood pressure medication, and by 30, she was taking three blood pressure medications a day. She had blood sugar dysregulation, and she was almost 300 pounds. She hit a wall and realized that enough was enough, that she needed to not only transform her own life, but then take the things that she learned to be able to transform the lives of others. This is an important story because it covers an important topic, and Tabitha addresses it with grace and dignity and insight, um, and true to form for the Anthropology Podcast, pulls in some really amazing entrepreneurial nuggets, including sharing with us uh, the next phase of her entrepreneurial journey and this really amazing and tasty initiative that she has on the table. It was a real pleasure chatting with her, learning about her story and really how her story became the impetus for her purpose, which is from my perspective, one of the key ingredients to not only transform your health, but to really drive your business forward. She was a pleasure to chat with and it is my honor to share with you Tabitha Carr. Dr. Tabitha Carr, welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. Thank you for having me, Megan. Well, it's a pleasure to have you here today, and I'm really excited to uh, to delve into this conversation, but also to hear a little bit more uh, about your your story. I was so struck when I I spent some time on your website and, and reading through your material, but the journey that got you uh, to where you are now in terms of supporting other people and, and women in their journey of health. Take us through your personal story and, and how you got to this place in your career. Well, I am so, so blessed and and so thankful because I have had quite the journey. My journey started out um, in high school. In high school, I was an overweight teenager and I was first put on my first blood pressure pill at the age of 16. Um, So it was then when I started having my health challenges, you know, I didn't have really anyone um, to educate me or or tell me exactly why, you know, I was having high blood pressure. You know, when I asked the doctor, why do I have to take this pill? You know, she said, so you won't have a stroke at the age of 30. And I said, oh, you know, and still, I don't know what all of this means. And, you know, being so young, I, I doubt I took the medicine like I was supposed to anyway. Um, but on into my 20s, you know, I continued to have health challenges. Uh, you know, by the time I was 30, I was on my third blood pressure pill. And I remember being put on that third blood pressure pill be- to protect my kidneys from the first blood pressure pill. I was having blood sugar um, issues. 
I was having panic attacks um, going into 30. You know, I started having hormonal problems at 35 where I was on a continuous cycle. So, you know, it just you know, progressively, I just started having problems after problems after problems because of, you know, my lifestyle. So it was around the age of 35 when I finally said, okay, enough is enough because the hormonal problems was basically leading to me being fatigued and really weak and, you know, the loss of blood. The doctor said, well, you know, we can try, you know, putting you on this prescription or putting you on this, um, a birth control pill or, or you, you know, you having this surgery, you know, to remove, you know, whatever. And I said no, because I hadn't had any kids at the time. And I just, you know, said, I can't deal with this anymore. You know, I'm almost 300 pounds. I'm on blood pressure pills. You know, my blood sugar is wonky. I'm having hormonal issues. And now you're threatening my ability to have children. And I just said enough is enough. And I just started looking at natural ways to heal my body. And within 30 days, I stopped having the menstrual problem. And it was from there that I said, okay, you know, I'm ready. I'm ready to change my life because I'm the person that year after year, I would start a diet. You know, I start a diet every January. I mean, we all do this, right? Um, But I was gaining weight every single year. And it seemed like I was on a diet every single day in my life. I was always on a diet. And that is what had to change. That had to change. And so I want to get into what changed and I want to get into um, how you transformed your health. But I want to actually back up for one second because you said you went on your first blood pressure medication at 16. And I feel like this journey you just described for us is a journey of so many people. And it's it's why the healthcare system in the US and in Canada is so, is so stretched um, at this point. How as a 16 year old, were you learning about health and, and how to value your body? Where did, where did that knowledge come from? I didn't, that's, that's the problem. Uh, (laughs) No one was there as a 16 year old to educate me as to why I was having blood pressure problems. Um, you know, because blood pressure could be, It could be weight alone. It could be stress. It could be a sodium potassium imbalance. It could be um, kidney stress or kidney weakness. There's so many reasons why your blood pressure could be high. But instead of um, the doctor trying to troubleshoot to see why a 16 year old was having high blood pressure, you know, that didn't happen. I was just put on a prescription drug, Um, you know, and I grew up in the South. I grew up in the South where we eat rich foods, you know, rich foods that taste good. Um, so I really wasn't educated on, on healthy lifestyle and healthy eating and clean eating at that time. Yeah. And I asked the question because I, I, I anticipated your response, but I think it opens up this, this notion of, you know, 16 year olds don't know how to do this on their, on their own and their, their family is going to be an influence, but society has an opportunity to be an influence at that point. And, and as a, as, as naturopaths, I think our lens is always like, how the heck do we get more upstream in supporting, in supporting health? And I think your story is such a poignant illustration of this idea that Mm -hmm. the seeds of health are planted very early in one's life. And if we can start to have an influence earlier in, in, in someone's life, then we don't necessarily need to see the types of stories that you just described over and over again. But when we do, what's going to be so interesting for people is to understand how you made that transformation. So take us through how, like what happened that you were just like, enough, enough. This is like, I've always tried diets. It's, it's changing. It's getting bigger. It's getting deeper. What, what triggered the transformation? And then tell us what you did to, to change your health. 
Absolutely. And, and, you know, when you were talking, I was thinking, you know, you're on to something. It really starts with the families. You know, the families, we have to get more educated because even when I see clients, you know, if the clients, um, if my parents have a, a unhealthy lifestyle, you know, it trickles down to the children. Um, but, you know, 25 years ago, you know, when I was struggling having these problems, you know, we weren't really talking about healthy eating. We weren't, uh, you know, vegan, vegetarian. You didn't hear stuff like that, no, right? No, absolutely. Uh, so, so yeah, we weren't educated. Um, but for me, I've always been interested in that healthcare field. You know, I, I majored in biology. You know, I have a master's in, in health administration. You know, I felt like um, pretty much I didn't have self-confidence in myself to really um, be a doctor when I wanted to be, you know, back when I was in my 20s because I was overweight and unhealthy myself. So because of that low self-esteem and not having any faith in myself, I kind of steered off my path and I didn't go right into the, the medical field. Um, I pursued um, technology. Um, but, you know, when I was 35 and really having those hormonal problems, I mean, I was just I was sick and tired, you know, being overweight, you know, it just leads and, and living an unhealthy lifestyle just leads to a plethora of problems, you know, low energy, hormonal problems, you know, and it's just a cycle. And I finally said, OK, you know, I'm 35 years old. I, I didn't feel like I was where I wanted to be in life, overweight, having hormonal problems. And I said, you know what? This is, I was really hard on myself. I said, this is ridiculous. I said, I've been doing this all my life. I've been doing this all my life. I've been on a diet all my life. It's like the more I diet, the more weight I gain. I just can't do it. So I had to figure it out. You know, I had to root cause exactly what was going on. And, you know, I said, it's not the lack of exercise. It's what I'm eating. I can lose the weight, but I can't keep it off. So I had to identify, you know, what that self-sabotage is. It was through a lot of prayer. Let me tell you, it's prayer, continuous prayer, you know, working on myself, figuring out the root cause, figuring out what's going on with me hormonally, you know, what's going on with my mood. And that's all, of course, um, related to the diet as well. Um, so really figuring that out and then taking it day by day and just focusing on me, focusing on what I'm eating and just focus on my daily spiritual walk. That's what I had to do. And how did how did that process get? And I don't want to. Well, I'll just use the word because another better word's not coming to me. But how, what was the what was the medicalization of that process? Because I, I, not to dismiss the the importance of of prayer and the spiritual component. And actually, before we get into the medicalization piece, I will say I had this conversation with a patient this week, and she was like, "What's the deal? I keep I have this very complicated relationship with." with food. And, and I said to her gently, I was like, I think that when we have complicated relationships with food, it's because we initially have very complicated relationships with ourselves. Mm -hmm. And food is a, the complicated relationship with food is a symptom to that. So I don't in any way and we can talk about it want to be dismissive of the, the mental emotional work that you did on yourself. But what were some of the other tools and tactics that you brought into play because you like really transformed your, your health, you were really overweight. And it, it, it would have required multiple uh, mechanisms to be able to start to turn that around. What other things were a part of that part of that process for you? It honestly, you know, it, it was it was body, mind, spirit. <laughs> it was changing the food that I ate, changing my mindset, and again, that spiritual walk, really grounding myself. Um, it's, it's all about, you know, accepting the fact that there's not a quick fix. You know, I had to turn that around. You know, I went into these, um, new year's resolution thinking, okay, I'm gonna drop 10 pounds this month. I'm gonna drop another 10 pounds the next month. And, you know, the year I lost the weight, it didn't necessarily happen like that. I remember that very first month that January I said, okay, 
I'm not going to focus on exercising. I'm just going to focus on the food I eat. That's it. And I lost eight pounds. I remember losing eight pounds that month with no exercising. Because the problem is I was always exercising and eating less, you know, starting out the new year, I would be so tired, my body would be wiped out. And then I would just, it's like my body was starving. And I would just turn the food because I'm basically starving myself because I'm not eating hardly anything. And then exercising so much to where I'm starving myself. So I, I changed that. And I incorporated exercising in my second month. And I remember, remember like my third or fourth month, I didn't lose weight. And I said, okay, let's sit down and let's figure out why didn't I lose weight. And then I said, okay, I had a couple of big dinners or all you can eat things here. So I had to, you really have to study exactly what's going on as far as your eating Um, If it's a hormonal problem, it could be a hormonal problem. It could be a blood sugar problem, but the hormones and the blood sugar will come into balance when the food is corrected and when the nutrition is corrected. We might need a mineral supplement or we might need a vitamin, Um, but it really was figuring out what my trigger was as well. My trigger was stress. I was a stress eater. (laughs) So, you know, just really figuring that out. So it's a number of things. It's food, it's exercise, it's mindset. It's all of that. Yeah, absolutely. And I have so many patients who are like, listen, I eat clean and I exercise all the time and nothing, nada. I can't get, I can't get I can't get the number to change. And when you're looking at someone from a hormonal perspective, where do you start? What are some of the the biggies uh, that we should be looking at putting on people's radars as they have conversations with their practitioners? Liver, 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 (laughs) liver. That is a a lot of times that's where I start. Um, You know, if there is an, an estrogen dominant situation, I look at the liver even when it's a thyroid um, issue, I still um, look at the liver or support the liver. Even if it's the adrenals, I support the liver because the liver is, you know, that most important big organ. When you say what's the biggie, it's the liver. It's the liver. A lot of times we have a fatty liver, a clogged liver. Um, So I start there. And how do you start there? And what kind of things should people be uh, should be th- should they be looking for? Because I think that for a lot of people, they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I should support the liver if I have a few extra drinks or sure, I'll put myself on milk thistle. And it's it's just so much more complicated uh, than that. And we can be so much more sophisticated in how we in how we approach it. What are some of the symptoms that um, that women should really look for in terms of generally uh, indicating congestion of the liver? Yeah. So, so one of the things I ask, you know, the, the, quite the first question I ask women is how many times are you pooping a day? <laughs> Love uh, it. Yeah. Let's I, go I, there because it's so important. It is so important. And believe it or not, I have women tell me I only poop once a week and I'm like, Oh, I believe it. Oh my goodness. You know, well, that's a tell sign. You know, if you're not eliminating um, as many times as you eat a day, you know, people ask me all the time, how many how many times am I supposed to go? And I normally say around two to three depends on how much you're eating, you know, when you're eating. And if we're not letting go, if we're not releasing, then of course, you know, estrogen is recirculating, you know, into our bodies. You know, we're going to have hormonal problems. A lot of times when I correct pH and just correct that those bowel movements, I see clients getting better all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's something that we don't want to talk about. Um, Mm -hmm. And it's definitely not something that we sit around with our girlfriends uh, and discuss. But I think there's there's a massive variance in an individual's understanding of what normal is. What are some of those fundamentals? And I know you're big on fundamentals. and We'll talk about your formula for good health. But what are some of the fundamentals that we should really have in play in terms of supporting optimal bowel function? Fiber. (laughs) Definitely fiber. And, you know, it, it really just it's, it's discouraging or it's a little frustrating um, when I hear uh, I'll just say ketos um, say that they don't 
you know, necessarily believe in getting fiber in their diet. You know, they just believe in the protein and the fat. And I'm like, you got to have fiber in your diet. It is so important. And plus, fiber helps, you know, grab the fat and expel the fat out of your body. So, yeah, it's it's fiber, fiber and water. Of course, you can't take in the extra fiber without taking in the extra water. So half your body weight in water um, in ounces, um, not to exceed 12 cups is is very important when it when it comes to keeping things moving fiber and water and do you do you subscribe to a, a balance between soluble and insoluble fiber or like do you have some go-to fibers that you really love to use you know i i always say if you're eating enough of your vegetables and fruit you should be getting vi- a fiber if you're eating if you're incorporating beans or legumes into your diet. You know, some people don't believe in the beans and legumes, then you're getting your fiber. Um, If you're incorporating still cut oatmeal, you're getting your fiber. You can get your fiber from food. However, if you're not getting your fiber from food, then then of course, you know, there's all sorts of fiber supplements out there and you can get as basic as organic um, psyllium, you know, which has the soluble and the insoluble fiber in it. So you need just a balance of both, but you can definitely get this from food. And that's the problem when we're not eating correctly, when we turn to bacon and eggs for breakfast and a uh, burger and fries for lunch and, you know, whatever else for dinner, then we're not, we're not getting the fiber that we need in our diet. Yeah, it's such a good point. And I'm, I'm only bringing this analogy up because I'm talking to someone from the South and I'm in Toronto, but I use a snowplow analogy when I'm talking about fiber, which probably won't work for your population. But I say that insoluble fiber, which is like carrots and and celery and cucumber, that's like the snowplow that they send out when the snowstorm first starts that just gets snow out of the way quickly and it and it just pushes things to the side. It's not pretty, it's not perfect, but it, it does the job. And um, soluble fiber, so that's insoluble fiber, soluble mm-hmm. fiber in contrast, and these would be things like psyllium or ground flax or brown rice powder or any of those types of things. This is like, and I'm not sure if you've ever seen this, Tabitha, but when there's a big snowstorm up here, what happens is a whole line of snow plows will line up on a highway and it's like one is the leader on the inside and then it pushes snow to the next, to the next, to the next, and you have this line of snow plows and you cannot get by them. But man, mm-hmm. do they do a good job. Like the highway will be clear behind them. And that's what that's what and it's and they're slow. And that's what insoluble fiber does is it moves so I'm not telling you this. I'm telling our listeners this. Um, it moves so it moves slowly and it and it regulates uh, it regulates bowel function. And that's why it's so awesome. But you're right. Like you can get that from food, like throw some ground flax on top of your on top of your salad and, and you have that effect. I don't know anybody, and you're you're probably the same in your practice. I don't know anybody who isn't a happier person when they have more regular, complete bowel movements. It's like a very rapid access point to happiness. Yes. Oh my goodness. And you feel so much more lighter. <laughs> yes. People will come in. They're like literally. They're like I I've had bowel movements twice a day for the last two weeks, and I am ecstatic. Um, and I've never talked to someone about a constipation as a source of uh, and cause of depression. But I suspect that that would be a really interesting uh, evaluation of um, of individuals struggling with depression is the ro- the role between that and and uh, and constipation. Absolutely. Because, I mean, it, it's energy. It's it's being depressed. It's feeling stuck. You know, when, when you are constipated, you feel stuck stuck literally and figuratively Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely Tabitha take us through your formula for good health because I I fundamentally believe that these foundational elements are so critical um, to somebody's good health and you've done a really good job about um, and establishing uh, these in a really concrete uh, concrete way take us through what that formula is for you Well, as I I mentioned before, water, 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 water. I was the person that only probably drank a a half a cup or maybe a cup, may not even that, of of water a day. So now I drink half my body weight in water every single day. And, you know, people just kind of you know, ignore water. It's like, oh, water, whatever. Like, it's a big deal. 
you know, so water, uh, exercise, exercise is a big deal when it comes to moving toxins out of the body, moving fluid. Um, you know, me, I know when I have stagnant um, fluid um, in my body, if I go and get on an, an elliptical machine or something, that fluid just comes off, especially if I'm drinking the water to get it off. Um, you know, a clean diet. You know, we've been talking about the diet, you know, being grounded, being grounded, um, mind, body, spirit, being grounded in your spirit, spiritual practice. You know, for women, um, especially the women who need additional support, um, whether it's hormones or, you know, energy or, you know, for their strength, I always say B vitamins, omega threes. Um, they might need a mineral supplement um, to add in. And don't be afraid. I, I tell my clients, don't be afraid of taking a supplement. You know, you know, we have this, I don't know, perception of not wanting to take anything, but, you know, minerals and, and fatty acids. I mean, it is food, you know, it's the additional food that we need because our soil is depleted or we're just not eating enough of the right things. So water, exercise, clean diet spiritual practice, be grounded in that and make sure you're supporting your body hormonally and with any additional supplements that you need. Yeah, I, I love that. It's, it really, it is never one thing. It is all of these things that tend to tend to come together. Uh, I would love your perspective. And, and we talked about this a little bit before in terms of like, how do we get upstream and how do we really start to address the root cause as someone who has transformed their health and, and really fundamentally changed the trajectory of their life and of their health? What sort of elements do you think we need to have in play as a society to assist in um, curtailing the obesity epidemic that we are seeing in Western society? It's a big you know, question. I know. And, and we need to be more vocal. We need to be more aware. You know, I was watching um, the Today Show, and, and, and this is a little bit different about, you know, the weight issue that we have, but I, I think it, it goes hand in hand because it just brought me to tears. Um, you know, it was about this family whose little boy uh, suffers from from seizures and nothing was helping, you know, been to doctor after doctor after doctor after doctor. And finally, they turned to marijuana. Um, I can't remember the state that they live in, but the state, of course, you know, says it's illegal. It's illegal to smoke marijuana. We all know that. And the the children or, or the boy was taken away um, from from the parents. Um, so, you know, the parents, of course, uh, were arrested. Um, they're out on bail now. But, you know, that's the extent of, of the story that I know. I really don't know anything else about, you know, the background, so on and so forth. But my point here is that that's really sad. You know, it's sad that we're not putting more money um, into natural health um, herbs, that we're not studying and really researching more these things that can help us, that can help us with, you know, in this example, with seizures. Um, so I think we need to be more vocal. We need to be more aware of what's going on. And we just need to have a bigger voice um, about what uh, the government says we can and cannot do um, when it comes to these natural remedies that are out there to help us and to support us. I'm a believer that God gave us everything on earth that we need um, for our bodies, but we're not given an opportunity uh, to actually utilize what has been given to us. And, and in, in this example, in this boy's example, that's one of them. So, yeah, I think that's such a good point. And I find medicinal marijuana is, is, is so fascinating to me um, as a naturopathic yeah. doctor. I feel like I'm just screaming from the rooftops and like, albeit there's, there's, a, there's a lot of research and, and interest in this, especially in Canada right now, because it is, um, 
it is it is no longer going to be uh, i'll get the legal aspects of it incorrect but but marijuana we will have legal access to it as of uh july 1st in uh in canada but i feel like this is the one herb that everyone's like oh it's this wonder herb and i was like there are hundreds of these things that exactly. if we would pull equal resources into that we would have a whole new um pharmacopoeia and access and dispensary and way of 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 addressing people's health and i'm hoping that this is really a gateway into looking at some of these other uh, other botanicals and natural treatments that people have been using for a long period of time with with great uh with great efficacy but it's a it's a yeah it's a really great point i want to transition a little bit tabitha because um i think it's, it's super important to find a way in every podcast to talk about chocolate and um I want you to tell us a little bit about Good Girl Chocolate and this initiative that you have. We've got a ton of entrepreneurs on board and and more and more I'm finding that we're talking about food entrepreneurs and people with really cool ideas. Can you tell us a little bit about what this is that you've created? Absolutely. Well, again, because I've struggled with my weight all my life, I created Good Girl Chocolate because like every other girl, I did not want to give up chocolate. So I felt it was my duty um, to create (laughs) a, yes, it was my duty to create a healthier version of chocolate. So this chocolate is, it's, it's guilt-free, you know, it doesn't have any dairy in it. It doesn't have any butter in it. You know, it's, it's sweetened with organic plant-based sugars like coconut sugar, which holds a low glycemic um, rate. Um, it is 75% dark. You know, we know that the, the, the chocolate in grocery stores, you know, it's 80% sugar normally, um, which is a lot. You know, the first ingredient you read is sugar. And it's so it's so frustrating, you know, when I go into these boutique stores and see this gourmet chocolate and it has sweetened condensed milk in it and it has high fructose corn syrup in it and it has genetically modified ingredients in it. You know, and all this is on the label and we're paying like high dollar for this. I'm like, this is nonsense. No. Yeah, it's garbage. It's total garbage. Yeah. It is. So I created Good Girl Chocolate, um, you know, with with the fact in mind that, you know, we're so hard on ourselves. You know, if we eat something bad, we always say, oh, I've been bad today. Or if we're perfect and we eat really, really good, we reward ourselves and say, oh, I've been really good. Tabitha, take us through how you you actually created this uh, as a product, how you actually created Good Girl Chocolate as a product, because first of all, let me just say, I looked at pictures of this online and I'm like, this looks amazing and totally decadent. And then two, like that just takes a, a little bit of entrepreneurial hoops up to be able to like jump in there and be like, I am going to, I'm going to, I'm going to build something and make it available to people. How did you do that? How did you build a food product that people can purchase? Oh yeah. So this started, you know, again, like I said, I have been on a diet every single day of my life. So this started 10 years ago, you know, with me in the kitchen trying to find, you know, healthier ways of eating. And I started making chocolate. Um, I I never sold it. I just kind of gave it to my family and I, you know, ate it myself. But, you know, when I lost weight and, you know, again, I was going into stores and I couldn't find anything that I wanted that tasted good, that was looked pretty or, you know, looked like a, a truffle that I wanted to eat. I said, OK, it's time to bring this to the market. And that is exactly what I did. Um, I, I, you know, I said, what what does women want? You know, what do they want? You know, I these are women like me who are trying to eat healthy, who are trying to maintain, you know, their healthy lifestyle. You know, we want something cute and pretty and that tastes delicious. Um, And we want it to be healthy. So that's what I did. That's exactly what I did. Good for you. And where, where do you sell it now? Like where people, where can people get it now? Right now, it's online. It will be in my local mall here in Oklahoma City in a couple of weeks. And then in a few months, I will be launching in Dallas, Texas at the at the Galleria. So um, right now, it's at goodgirlchocolate.com. 
Good for you. I think that is, uh, I think that's totally amazing. And that's, that is the essence of entrepreneurism right there is, is you, you captured a need um, and you blended it with your, your background and your passion, which is helping people to live, uh, live healthier lives. Probably a really good place to segue in terms of asking you, what do you want your legacy to be? Tabitha leads with her heart. You know, I lead with my heart. I lead with my heart. I lead with my soul and I lead with integrity, um, with unwavering faith, you know, changing lives as well as saving lives and and restoring hope, you know, restoring hope, you know, women who have just, you know, lost hope, you know, lost faith, you know, because their their health is, you know, deteriorating just for for multiple, multiple reasons. Um, so someone that has, you know, restored hope and, and changed lives. Beautiful. How would you define health? Body, mind and spirit. So simple. I love it. We've all heard that mindset has a huge influence on our ability to be effective and amplify in this world. But what if I told you your brain biochemistry, literally the neurotransmitters that are existing within your nervous system, can help amplify your mindset or your capacity to be effective? They can help accelerate your mission in the world. More and more with both my coaching clients and my patients, we end up having a conversation related to our own ability to control our nervous system through the optimization of neurotransmitters. Now, what the heck do I mean by this? The foods that you eat, the way that you think, your interaction with the world has the capacity to increase things like serotonin or dopamine, some of these really important neurotransmitters to helping you be effective and operate at your best. After listening to literally thousands of conversations with my clients and with my patients, I pulled together a very quick checklist so that you could have a better understanding of the things you're doing every single day to amplify your nervous system or downregulate it in a way that isn't necessarily serving your mission. If you want access to this information and want to learn a little bit more about how you can optimize your brain health for success, visit meganwalker.com forward slash brain health to grab your handout now. Now, back to our episode. What a perfect place to transition to the second component of the interview. And um, these are what I call KPIs or key performance indicators. So just like we have these in our businesses, I believe we also have them uh, in our lives with respect to our health as well. So indulge me. I've got six quick questions for you. Mm -hmm. The first is, do you have a morning routine? And if so, can you share it? I do. I do have a morning routine. And let me tell you, I am so proud of it um, because I have not always done this every day um, in the past, but now I do it every day. And if I skip it, um, things just aren't right. And that is prayer and meditation, prayer and meditation every single day morning. I take time out. Good for you. Fiction or nonfiction. What are you reading right now? Oh, gosh, it is always <laughs> nonfiction. I, I'm a sucker for beauty and, and health um, literature. So you probably won't ever catch me just reading just a, you know, a fiction book. I'm all about health and beauty. And is there something right now that is on your on your bedside table or are you between titles? Where are you at? Oh, my gosh. That <laughs> or is there just too many sitting there to it's be able to narrow it down? It is too many. Let me tell you, it's just it's so I have just it's just too many. What's, it's not one. I, I, listen, I hear you on that. What is the one thing you are most consistent with with respect to your health? Drinking water. Beauty. Drinking water. And, and that is because I tell my clients, you have to drink water. So it would be drinking water because I've never been a water drinker. And I tell you, my I, I seriously believe and know that it's because of water um, that my body stays cleaner. My body stays leaner. Uh, my face stays clearer. <laughs> it's drinking water. What is something totally badass about you that people would not otherwise know? I play the piano and I can sing. Oh, I love it. I wish I had those two skills. What do you do for fun or play? 
Oh my goodness. I, I take time out for myself and I hang out with friends who love me and I love them. Brilliant. I wish more people would take time to do that. And last question for you, entrepreneurism, are we born this way or do we learn to become entrepreneurs? You know, I believe that we are, we do, we all have God given talents. Um, we all have gifts, you know, that we are born with. So I, I believe anyone can be an entrepreneur. I do believe that some people might need to be taught, you know, a skill or a skill set. Um, but I think we all have it in us to be to be entrepreneurs. But you have to want it. Um, you have to be diligent. You know, if you don't want it, then you're not going to be it. Uh, so it's something that you have to want and it's something that you have to work for and you have to want to work for it. Absolutely. Identify with that purpose and you can you can really do anything. I, I, I love your message. I love your story. I love the transformation that you have uh, you've taken yourself on and that you now lead others on as well. Where can people follow up with your work, Tabitha, because you're up to some really incredible things in this world? Yes. Yeah, so I, my website is livingandlovinglife.org, uh, goodgirlchocolate.com. Um, I have a Facebook group, uh, Holistic Naturopathic Wellness with Dr. T. And I am on Instagram as goodgirlchocolate. Amazing. Well, best of luck to you as you expand the Good Girl Chocolate Empire um, and best wishes as you as you transform people's health in an incredible way. Thanks so much for being our guest today. Thank you, Megan. I had so much fun and I'm just so thankful for your podcast and what you're doing and the education that you are providing for people. Oh, thank you so much. If you enjoyed our conversation and would like to hear more, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and subscribe to the Anthropology Podcast. We would also really appreciate a quick review. When people have their health, they can change the world. Let us keep you healthy and you go change the world.